Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Welcome to episode six of Toolkit Tuesday, presented by The Open Group. Glad to have you here today, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're keeping safe and sane, and I hope that there are some uh, some signs of, uh, of, of life returning to something more normal than it's been recently, um, wherever you are. Um, but um, the most important thing today is that you're with us, and uh, and we're delighted to have you. And we have a great uh, a great session today. Ask the experts. But before I get there, just uh, just one thing I want to uh, say. Something we're quite proud of at the Open Group. Um, September thirtieth, so just uh, twelve days ago, we celebrated twenty five years of the Open Group, and we'll be continuing to celebrate twenty five years of the Open Group, uh, particularly at our event later this month. So do look out for that. But um, a lot's been done over 25 years, and we'll have a, a little uh, retrospective uh, a look at what we're currently doing and a look forward um, from all around the world, um, as this event will be. So we're very proud of our, of our global reach. So just a few housekeeping things to make sure that uh, you get the most out of today's session. Um, you'll see in WebEx there's a chat function. Please use that to chat amongst uh, other at attendees. One of the fun things we like to do is just uh, have people say where they're joining from. That's uh, that's always interesting. Uh, and anything else you want to share there. If you want to share um, a question, you can also do that in the Q&A panel. But today, I'd rather you actually went to uh, a different way to ask questions, which is slido.com. Um, it doesn't, it's not an app, it doesn't require a download, any internet enabled device will, will work. Go to slido, S-L-I-D-O.com. And uh, enter the event name is toolkit hyphen Tuesday. So toolkit hyphen Tuesday, and that will let you in. You'll be able to uh, ask questions and polls. Obviously, we only have a limited amount of time, so can't promise everyone's questions will get answered, but we will certainly do our best. So with that in mind, I'll move straight to introducing today. Oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, just to get the the, the biggest impact or to be able to see and see and hear the um, panelists correctly if you look towards the top of your screen at the layout there's a there's an option to see or not see um participants without video if you if you make sure it's not it's not checked um or clicked uh, that way you'll be able to see just the uh, just the panelists and the, and the people who are who are talking today so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel of experts. Those of you who've been um, attending the series earlier will have seen some, if not all, of these. But um, I'll start the introductions. Um, first up, Terry Blevins. Terry is owner and operator of EnterpriseWise LLC, where he provides strategic enterprise architecture services. He's worked in the computing industry for over 40 years now and is currently a director of the Open Group Governing Board and a fellow of the Open Group, longtime contributor. Welcome, Terry. Glad to have you here. Next, uh, Chris Frost of Fujitsu. Chris has worked for Fujitsu since 2005 in a variety of technical leadership roles. At present, he's the principal enterprise architect within the global delivery unit at Fujitsu, which provides standard services, technical guidance, and support for the global Fujitsu group. 
Inside the Open Group, Chris led the TOGAF Agile Working Group during 2020 um, and is contributing to a number of current architecture forum activities. Before Fujitsu, Chris worked for EDS, which is now part of DXC, or several uh, on several large contracts for the Ministry of Defence in the UK. And in earlier years, uh, he worked for Ford, Shell, and a small startup software house called Shamrock Marketing. So welcome, Chris, glad to have you back. Next up, Paul Homan. Paul is an IBM Distinguished Engineer and Chief Technology Officer for in the industry sector clients in IBM Global Services, responsible for technology strategy and industry architecture for the automotive, aerospace and defense, oil and gas, electronics, industrial products and construction industries, wide range there. Paul also represents IBM on the Open Group Governing Board and is co-chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum. So welcome, Paul. Glad to have you here. Next up, Chris Ford. Chris is CEO of the Association of Enterprise Architects since 2016. He's based in Shanghai, China, and he also holds the post of General Manager Asia Pacific for the Open Group. Chris is also responsible for um, uh, for all enterprise architecture services in the Open, Open Group as Vice President of Enterprise Architecture, including our TOGAF and Archimate standards. Chris has deep expertise in enterprise architecture. As a member, representative and chair of the Architecture Forum in his past, he was instrumental in driving the successful development and launch of TOGAF 9 between 2007 and 2009. And last but by no means least, Andrew Josie, VP of Standards and Certification at the Open Group, overseeing all certification and testing programs here, here at the Open Group. He also manages the standards process for us and since joining the company in 1986, Andrew has been closely involved with the standards development, certification and testing activities of the Open Group. He's led many standards development projects, including specification and certification developments for Archimate, TOGAF, POSIX and UNIX programs. He's a member of IEEE, USENIX, FLOSS UK and the Association of Enterprise Architects. So we have our experts, um, welcome everyone and uh, we'll 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 start off a reminder questions please go to slido.com and they should come to me and, I, and i'll see them but i'll um I'll, I'll, let, let's let's kick one off with uh, oh here we go okay so um here we go with the first question so maybe i'll direct this towards let's see chris maybe with your aea hat on and uh, perhaps your open group hat on um what type of skills do you want to see in successful enterprise architects? Is it familiarity with new technologies or the ability to abstract them and present them or the knowledge of frameworks like TOGAF or something else? What do you like to see? I know the, the AA is involved in the uh, professional development side um, of architects. So what do you see there? If you can kick us off, Chris. Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, we recently conducted a survey of the AEA membership in partnership with uh, McKinsey and the Henley School of Business. And one of the interesting things that came out of that survey was, yes, all of those things are important depending on the nature of your role and the nature of your company. But the, uh, the thing that, one of the things that came forward in that survey was the need for flexibility in the enterprise or the architects, no matter what role or specialization they have, um, but also the development of soft skills, the ability to communicate, to relate to others' uh, situations, and to uh, synthesize problems and solutions. That's a great, great summary. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else want to uh... Add anything on that and no obligation to because we have limited time and multiple questions but uh, what skills you like to see in architects if not then um, I'm going to go to the question that were, was bound to come in um, and uh, one we've covered to some extent um, maybe Chris Frost I can aim this one at you first um, how does how does the TOGAF standard and traditional enterprise architect architecture play with Agile? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, question that uh, grapple with quite a lot. Um, 
So, I mean, the short answer to that is very well indeed. Uh, the, these things play together very well indeed. Um, uh, presented on the topic a, a number of times, and the, the points I often sort of open with is that you know, any sort of large project, no matter what you're doing, uh, needs some sort of architecture, whatever that might be appropriate to that particular project. But it's it's having those sort of uh, patterns agreed up front as to uh, broadly how are you going to structure this solution what are the major components how are they going to interact together um, and uh, those are the sorts of things that we would uh, define in an enterprise architecture for an it led solution and whether you deliver that in an agile way or in a waterfall way or whatever form of delivery you're using you need that that a certain degree of architecture up front and it's very interesting that most of the agile at scale methods that there are around things like like safe and, and disciplined agile um, sort of like acknowledge that quite explicitly so yeah these things play together very well and architecture is just as vital and enterprise architecture and things like TOGAF are just as vital now um, in agile delivery as they always were Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the agile topic? I, I, I'll I'll join in if you can. Um, hear me okay. I've had to switch camera again. So no, you're um, looking good, Paul. Okay, great. Uh, so um, just sort of following up on that, I think um, one of the things that that you know we've noticed a lot over the last few years has been that constant question of of how do you work with agile delivery uh, in in solution development in particular. Um, I mean, there's business agility and how do you do architecture itself in a more agile way, of course, as well. And all those things are, are topics that, that we pick up and have some guidance around. Um, but if I just focus in on just solution development, um, actually architecting and a good practice in architecture is kind of a constant thread. What really changes is probably the way that you do it and the amount that you do it and when you do it and how you engage with the teams that are doing the delivery. So it's much more of a people and behavioural change than it is a, a content and method change. So, so there's plenty to learn from on all sides, I think. Um, and uh, But the actual content um, adapts really well. You just have to learn how to sort of make, uh, make that work in the organisation that you're working with. Right. Great. Great point. Great point. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, got, uh... Yeah. Okay. A, a slight switch from uh, from TOGAF, but still uh, still enterprise architecture related. Uh, I'm going to aim this one at you, Andrew. I think um, I'm learning how to use Archimate, and I've heard people mention the Exchange file format. What is that, and how could it help me? Okay. Well, this is a way to basically, when you create a model, it's a way to be able to share your model between different tools. Um, there was always a challenge uh, when we set off with um, with the Archimate language and uh, other, other other similar tools is how you, if you actually put a lot of effort into investing in model development, how do you, you preserve that investment? And this is one way that you can do because it, it actually frees up the um, that investment so you can move between different types of tools. So for example, you might start, um, and many people do start with the, the free uh, open source Archimate tool that's out there called Archie, um, perhaps do some modeling there and then start to move their tools to um, move their models, say, sorry, to uh, commercial tools. So um, mm -hmm. it's a way basically to preserve the investment. So if you are modeling in the Archimate language, you know that um, you're not going to have to um, you know, reinvest each time. I always used to think of it as um, it, before we had the exchange file format, it was like cave painting. We could basically do our models and it was but it was like painting on the walls of a cave we had to sort of hack the cave down or something hew the rocks out before we could move them but now we can actually um, take models from tool to tool and you can share models that's the great thing you can now share models we're starting to see models shared in repository there's the Archimate community that's formed out there now so people can go and uh, exchange you know literally as it's called the exchange file format it really is about exchanging models exchanging ideas um, there are also other things that we've seen other other applications using the file format to analyze models in different ways as well as actually sharing them between tools so it's um, 
it's a great enabler really um, everybody's starting to you know share tools you'll start to see from the open group as well you will start to see um, example models that come out so there are no longer just paper standards we've got a model that you can download what we call an ex executable standard now that you can actually say for example with the um, aviation the commercial aviation reference model we've got not only is that a paper standard but you can actually download the corresponding Archimate model. Same with several case studies. We've got banking, arch insurance, Archimetal. We've got several industry sort of models that uh, you can download. And I know that we've got more in development all the time. So it's it's about basically making standards work, as we say in the open group. It's actually getting yes. more out of our standards. Yes, we do. It's been our tagline for a while, hasn't it? Great, great uh, summary. Thank you, Andrew. So um, next question. Question. I'm going to come to you on this one, Terry, if I may. Um, I, I see the benefits of enterprise architecture. My manager has pointed me at the TOGAF standard. Where do I start? Okay, so uh, number number one, where, where you start is to make sure you're, you're fully uh, educated um, in, in, the, in the TOGAF uh, model. The architecture development model, um, but where you start within an enterprise uh, working on architecture uh, for for your boss is, um, uh, I would say, implement or execute the business scenario method. The business scenario method helps you identify the major pain points um, in in your organization and gets you right right there working on those pain points and getting an agreement with all the constituencies uh, on those pain points. And starting that way, working on people's real pain um, uh, make, makes you relevant right from the get-go. Right, great, great answer, thank you. Anyone else wanna chip in on where to start? It's a, it's a common, common topic, I know. Um, that in, involves all sorts of things. Steve, I'll just pick up on yes, one Chris. thing just to build on what uh, Terry was just saying. So um, absolutely right, sort of starting in that, that business layer and starting to look at what, what the sort of business problems are. And uh, one way to sort of help you through that is, um, and I don't think that the questioner said what particular industry they were involved in, but um, there are amongst the open group standards, a number of uh, reference architectures that have been developed for, for various industries. Not, not for all, it's true, but for some. Um, and they can be, just be a great way to sort of think through, you know, have I covered all of the aspects of this particular industry that I'm in, this particular organisation that I'm in? Really just to make to make sure that uh, you don't overlook any important aspects. Uh, and in particular, if you're in the you're actually in the IT industry itself as part of an IT uh, services organization, perhaps. And of course, we've got the, the, the IT for IT model, the IT for IT reference architecture. Um, and that's an absolutely fantastic way to sort of methodically work through the whole organization and start to look at you know, what, what capabilities we've got in different areas, what might be the pain points, what might be the gaps, where, where do I need to work on, where do I need to focus on? Great point. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. The, the the reference architectures have certainly been something that our membership in the open group has been keen to work on over the last probably decade or so. Um, it's the logical next step from the 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 more sort of generic uh, industry and technology agnostic approach of of TOGAF. It's uh, it's a good point. Good point. So um, next question: um, Why does TOGAF not suggest use of any specific tools? Who wants to take that one? No volunteers. Uh, I'll go for it, Steve. Uh, okay. Chris, Chris is all try and buck in. Chris is all try. Chris Doblecht, good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, fundamentally, it'd be a hell of a long list. All right. Uh, it's true. What, what TOGAF provides you with a framework to us uh, to assess and execute on solving a set of problems, whether they're technical, business oriented, a combination of both, or you know, information architecture, whatever, whatever the problem space is. And while there are clusters or centers of gravity around uh, tooling in enterprises, 
Um, the framework isn't prescriptive about that because if it is, what it may be being prescriptive about may be the wrong tool for the problem in the situation you're in. So the, the assessment phase leads you to a set of conclusions, if done effectively, that identify the nature of the tooling or the approaches you should be taking without presupposing those things up front. Now, of course, you do have an inventory of those things. Everybody does, okay? But uh, trying to assess that is really the key point rather than saying, here's the laundry list of things that you need to, uh, you need to have. Classes of tools uh, are much more likely to be uh, addressed in that way. Chris, I don't know if you agree with that. But... Chris, Chris yeah. and then I think Terry is uh, wanting to chip in too. Yeah, so uh, I think the, the point I'd add to that is that I'm very glad actually that TOGAF doesn't, uh, isn't prescriptive against any particular tool because you do need that choice depending on the type of problem that you're facing. Um, it, it, the, the reverse is, uh, is, is different in that there are a great many tools out there that implement or enable TOGAF in various ways. have got various aspects of the framework um, embedded within them. Um, and there's a lot of these tools out there. Just go onto any uh, search, search engine, you can quickly find plenty of them. Um, and really part of the skill is in figuring out which is the appropriate tool for my particular problem and my scale of problem, because just like any set of tools, depending on the scale of the problem you're tackling, you might need a different tool. So if you're tackling something quite small and simple, then quite small, simple tools will do. If you're tackling some immense um, organizational problem with lots of businesses involved, lots of activities, you might need a top end and therefore probably quite expensive tool. So you need to be able to make those choices. So um, I'm very yeah. pleased actually that TOGAF isn't prescriptive against any particular one. And as Andrew said, people often you know, might, might start with a less sophisticated tool, uh, maybe an open source tool, and then move to one of those more uh, uh, more robust uh, uh, commercial tools with more functionality. Yeah, that's a great comment. Terry, you wanted to comment? I, I just wanted to simply say uh, a quick answer is um, why not? Because by design, we chose not to, at least in the early uh, uh, evolution of TOGAF, and it was kind of for all the reasons that were stated above, but mainly because we knew that tools were going to uh, develop over time and they're constantly getting better and, and we want to enable that uh, that competition. Um, but no, we don't, uh, we intentionally decided not to recommend tools to be tools agnostic to enable uh, open competition in the environment. Right. Yeah. And we do have some uh, some uh, certification accreditation programs inside the open group that uh, we do. We do, don't we, Steve? Shall I just talk about the certification yeah, tools? Yeah. Yes, we do have tools, TOGAF 9 tool certification, also Archimate tool certification. If you go to our website and go down through the certification tab, you can find a register of the tools. And it's interesting when you look at the register, they all have a, a very detailed conformance statement because um, as I say, a tool could be for, 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 for a little or for a lot of the, what's covered by the standard. So you can actually go and evaluate um, each of the tools that is on the, on the register, a very detailed conformance statement you can look at to make your own assessment of which tools might be suitable for your problem. Great. Thank you. All right, we'll move on from tools. This, this one's got your name all over it, Mr. Holman. Um, do you have an EA mantra? Uh, but so I, I call it a mantra. Um, I, actually, it's just a tiny little checklist. Um, uh, and uh, anyone that's ever worked with me will be able to tell you what it is, to be honest. So uh, I think that's why it's sort of uh, probably recognizable. Um, so, so my mantra is in, in the enterprise architecture space, uh, we worry about three things, V, I, E, and they stand for viability, integrity, and extensibility. So the mantra behind that is that everything else you shouldn't be worrying about as much and, and the reason i put that in is i actually um uh, and and you know mayor culper uh, historically um see an awful lot of people working uh in enterprise architecture roles who have a huge amount of experience 
a lot of uh, knowledge, have probably you know uh, learned through experiences, good and bad, along the way. Um, try and actually end up redoing solutions that they see coming their way. Try and actually impose their thinking. And often it's it, that could be good because their thinking's better, but that's not really what they're there for. In my view, that's what the solution architects are, are there for. And to work with them, especially when we come back to that agile question earlier, the things that you can worry about over and above that that don't get picked up at, at the solution level are just one, will it work? Viability. Two, integrity. Will it damage anything else when you put it in? That's kind of you're worrying about the entire estate. And extensibility is... Well, nobody else actually is checking if all the sufficient doors are left open for that kind of future need uh, across the piece. So that's so that's my my mantra. Just worry about those three things. Uh, and genuinely, there are people um, that I've worked with who have printed out those three letters and stuck it on the wall above their desks when we used to have desks in, in offices. So I put that as my mantra. Good for you. Thank you, Paul. That's a, a great, great uh, explanation as to why as well. Anyone else have a mantra? Terry. Uh, architect for value and enable those that make decisions. Great. As simple as that. Always a good one. Yeah. Yeah, easy to forget sometimes in the uh, in the scope of some of these projects, but um, great one nonetheless. Um, now, let me see here. Um, uh, this is probably going to be our last question. Um, and I'm just trying to call it up here and it's eluding me, but from I just read it and I think it was how can one how could one use the TOGAF principles to uh, I can't find the question. Come here. Um, to streamline Stream. streamline processes across an organization multiple processes across an organization. How can we use the TOGAF principles to streamline processes across an organization? Anyone want to take that? Great, Terry, off you go. Well, uh, so that would become a, uh, a principle for a given organization. And I think the original text said to standardize processes. Standardize, you're quite right, thank you. Uh, many business units and so one would create uh that that principle for that organization and how you would implement it would be through the um uh, well how, how you sell it is through good rationale for doing that and how you would implement that is through the implications of those principles um so the implications might might be that every organization must have their processes. There must uh, there must be some governance to ensure that standardization of the uh, the processes existed. But um, you would go through the 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 method behind TOGAF principles to to implement that for an organization. Right. Thank you. And essentially, it's what it was designed to do. So uh, that's great. Anyone else have a comment on the? In answer to that question, a, a quick one from me, and I think this is just a, a gentle sort of corollary to it is um, as soon as you ask the question, one of the things when we were tying it back to one of the earlier questions is about where do you start and, and adding to that, I would put context in because when somebody asks me to standardize processes, my first question in my head is why do I want to do that? Because the first thing I want to check is is it actually the right thing to do? Because ruthless standardization mm -hmm. can be beneficial, but what is my motivation and my rationale? And that's how I would use the principles is to genuinely go back to the, what is it I'm trying to achieve? And then and then why? To make sure that that standardization, which sounds like a good idea on the face of it, actually is honoring the intent. Right, great point, great point. Anyone else wanna chip in? If not, then folks, we are going to leave it there. I always feel with these panel sessions that, that there's so much, so, so much more we could ask, and so much more you could uh, you, you could impart. But um, but we uh, have to be respectful of people's time and uh, across across the globe. So um, thank you to uh, to our experts today: um, Paul Homan, Terry Blevins, Chris Frost, Andrew Josie, and Chris Ford. Um, 
great job guys thank you very much and um and importantly a great thank you to everyone who joined us live and if you're watching this uh, afterwards on demand which many people do then uh, thank you for taking the time to do that so um basically that's that's uh, it for for episode six but please join us in two weeks time that's november 2nd um so you don't have to work that out where uh, my colleague, Dr. Palab Sahar, uh, General Manager for the Open Group in India, will be leading a session on digital government strategies and citizen-centric EA. And uh, if you haven't heard, and even if you have heard about the great work that's been going on there in enterprise architecture in India um, at various levels of government, then uh, Palab will uh, help us through uh, help us through some of that it's a it's a great great story and um and guess what a lot of it's based on our TOGAF standard so we've reason to be uh, very proud of that that's it for today folks um thank you from me um i'm steve nunn president and ceo of the open group and delighted you could join us have a great couple of weeks and uh, see you on november 2nd i hope take care and that was toolkit tuesday bye bye